Hi, everyone. This is the official Succession podcast from HBO and Pineapple Street Studios. I'm Kara Swisher. Yeah, that's his dick. He's sent you a picture of his dick by mistake. Life's not nice on horseback. It's a number on a piece of paper. It's a fight for a knife in the mud. On this episode, love is supposed to be in the air, but for the Roys, a beautiful wedding in Tuscany is just another opportunity to stick the knife in and twist. Caroline Roy is the one getting hitched, and she invited her tormented children and their tormenting father to her special day. It was a perfect setting for several Roy family heart-to-hearts who knew they had hearts. In fact, they don't. Let's just have it out, okay? I want to see you, Dad. I want to see you for dinner, and let's just nail this. Why does Kendall do this to himself? An audience with Daddy never ends well for him. Fuck off, kiddo. Good night. We're out of here. Later on, we have this episode's director, Mark Mylod, to talk about a couple of those very scenes. I would love to say that I constructed the scene from nothing, but obviously with that kind of writing and with those two actors, um, 98% of my job is done for me. So stick around for that. Normally, we'd start with the power rankings, but after an episode like this, I just need to talk to another fan about what the hell just happened. That's why I have Hunter Harris here. Hunter is a film and TV writer. She spent a lot of time at Vulture. There, she wrote a terrific article about the succession team's time filming in Tuscany this summer. Now she writes a substack called Hung Up, which I love. That's where she does her own set of weekly in-depth succession power rankings. Hi, Hunter. Welcome. Hi. Uh, this episode, what an episode. Just when you thought the Roys couldn't get any lower, somehow they find a way. Yes, I love this episode. I love all of the stuff between Shiv and Tom, particularly. It's so twisted and there's like so much humor in the discomfort between them, I think. Like this sort of- Meaning? There is such a power dynamic there that I feel like has long gone kind of unacknowledged where Shiv Mm -hmm. is like- obviously the Roy, um, the more powerful alpha between them. And she really tests the limits of Tom's love for her in this episode, I think. Like, even if you go back to season one, the night of the wedding saying that she wants an open marriage, I think we're seeing the the effects of like the just true imbalance in their relationship in this episode. And it comes out in like the most sort of twisted way with her being like, you're not good enough for me and I don't love you. It... It is just awful to watch, but I love it. Like, I can't get enough. You're not good enough for me. Oh, right. Oh, I see. Well, let's Mm -hmm. see about that. Yeah, no, I'm way out of your fucking league. Oh, you think so? Yeah? Uh Uh-huh. But that's why you want me. Mm, That's why... Maybe. You love me. Fuck you even though I don't love you. Also, and then later the next day, this is, this is sort of sex play they have before Mm -hmm. that where he, she, 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 when he says, you know, essentially talk dirty to me, that's where she goes, which is Mm -hmm. let me belittle you and make you think I don't love you. But the next day she keeps at it. She, she continues to, to say what it is. She says, I love you, but I don't love you, you know, which I thought was even worse in some way. Exactly. I think there is like, it's like dirty, but there is a glimmer in her eye that she, feels that, that she, that she sort of wants him to acknowledge it and wants to like say sort of the forbidden thing in their relationship, which is that, you know, that he's sort of like the bumbling doofus and they're working so hard so that she can have it all. Not necessarily that he can get a part of it. Um, and I think saying that unspoken thing is just so powerful and so uncomfortable. Um, and even the next day, yeah, when she keeps at it, you know, you can see the discomfort and how it's like painful for him. And that kind of bookended with the conversation with her mom from the night before is, I think there, this is something that I talked a lot about in Italy with um, Harriet and with Sarah a little bit is like- These are the actors. Yes, sorry. Um, who play Shiv and, and Caroline, how there is like this, um, they are sort of mirrors of each other, right? How Caroline is with this guy who, you know, kind of dawdles in business is not a very serious person. I think the kids are right to be sort of cautious of him because he does seem like kind of a doofus. And Shiv is with Tom, someone who she loves, but 
isn't so in love with, who who feels like not really on her level necessarily. And I think those parallels I thought were like really played out really nicely in this episode where you can sort of see mother and daughter in these sort of unhappy marriages and navigating them. Right. Except Tom really does love her. And you're sort of like, you're an idiot because this woman is not good enough for you. No, she'd like chew off her own leg if it meant that she could walk a little bit <laughs> yes. farther. Yeah. So and the discussion with her mother was just, I don't know. It was tough. I loved that scene. I, I watched him shoot that scene in Tuscany. And it was funny because a couple of times it was interrupted by like the, that like town square reacting to a soccer match. Um, and it's just like, how do you keep the emotional intensity of the scene in between people cheering on the like Italy team? Um, but I, I think it's like such a, there's so much resentment and there's so much um, pain in that scene. Like the part where Harriet is like, you know, you are my onion. You always chose your dad. I was, I'm, I always settle for scraps. I never want anything in my life. It's really powerful, I think, to see this, this softer side of someone who early in the episode basically disinvited her son, Kendall, from half of the wedding events because her ex-husband, who she hates, didn't want him there. Right, because she still depends on him financially, exactly, and and and, the st- and is still attached to him in some way. So w- when they were talking together, t- uh, Shiv did tear up. The mother didn't. She's like an old, crusty old husk of a person <laughs> in some way. I think the thing that really struck me is that Shiv always feels like you know, sort of slighted. I think she feels like the sister who yes. who's the only girl, obviously, but the one who never gets what she wants. Who who's always, you know, passed over in favor of this or that son or this or that, you know, person that's like in the C-suite in like the Roman and Logan's like um, team, you know, and she feels that in her family too. And I think that having her and Caroline really express these similar um, anxieties about never feeling included or never feeling like they're the priority. It was funny because it's like, I think Shiv has a line where she says, attention from you like that ship sailed a long time ago and I think Caroline is expressing the same thing about the kids that that they never give her attention and that she's always sort of in this battle with their dad to to, over their love and also over them you know they fight amongst themselves all the time for Logan's attention and they never fight for her attention so what's your reaction to the very last shot of Kendall in the pool it feels very sunset boulevard I think what we're seeing is that Kendall he's so you know just incredibly different than where he started the season, where he was like the people's champ, resistance hero, saying fuck the patriarchy. And now he is sort of, you know, back to where we saw him in season two, the beginning of season two, where he is sort of a shell of himself. I think he tried to go against his dad. It hasn't worked out. And he feels sort of, you know, morally, ethically bankrupt. The This like sort of conversation with Logan just devolved so intensely and rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's unpack that. How long was that kid alive before he started sucking in water? A couple of minutes? Three, four, five? What were you even doing? Uh, Chasing a bit of tail? Hey, are you queer? Did you try to fuck him? Or was it just the drugs? I'm better than you. Sure. You're my son. I did my best. And whenever you fucked up, I cleaned up your shit. And I'm a bad person? I think in that scene, we see a Logan that we don't usually get to see to his kids. We see, you know, this person who is so ambitious, so sort of thoughtless and careless to like the well-being of his own children we see like the person who was a titan of bed like of business and of industry and to see all that intensity and all that rage directed at his own child Mm -hmm. where he's really going i mean below the belt or whatever you want to call it but like bringing up the dead waiter from shiv's wedding yeah that's like that's not i think even logan puts on kid gloves sometimes when he's talking to and about his kids. And that feel, felt like a very insensitive, impersonal move in that moment. And I think that, you know, I think there is this part of Kendall that I find very tragic where he likes to be the bigger person. He likes to think of himself as the better person. And in that moment, Logan reminds him, actually, you're not. Like, you killed someone, and I've never done that, and no one else in our family has done that. And Logan just sort of twisting the knife in that way. Yeah. Yeah, because he always says, I'm the good one. And of course, he's not. Yeah, he was, what did he say to Shiv in episode two? I'm the real you. I'm who you think you are. Yeah. I think that sort of like self-righteousness is is really strong within him. So we can't not talk about Roman's dick pic debacle. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's listen to a clip really quick. Roman! Jesus. 
Are you a sicko? What is this? Oh, Why do you send them? Okay, it's just, you know, it's like, here's my dick. Oh, what? Like, uh, fuck you? People just send each other pics of their dicks. People send each other pics of their dicks. Yeah, have you heard of dick pics, Dad? Well, we do publish a number of popular newspapers, so yes, son. Uh, we probably invented the fucking words. But why? 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 I don't know. It's just like, here's my dick, I guess. Okay, we've seen it. We got to see it. We actually saw it. There it was. Um, so, so how did you react during the scene? Um, with my hands covering my eyes, I think I went back uh-huh. to watch it, like, maybe twice, just because I was like, oh, my God, wait, did he actually send it to his dad? Like, did I imagine that? And you see, like, oh, he got a text from his dad, was replying, and, you know, I, like, that kind of tech foible is so funny. With Roman, it's funny, because Kieran Culkin, when I was interviewing him, reminded me that there's a line in season one where Roman says, we all went to therapy, or I went to therapy, and, like, I'm, like, the best. I'm, like, the most fixed of us, like, the healthiest. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is, like, this weird sex thing that he has that Logan has for so long sort of not acknowledged or not tried to, like, take any ownership of. And it just kind of all comes out. I also love, like, just the total lack of um, sensitivity or even decorum with which Logan is like, Jerry's old. Like, how dare you? Right. That's the irony. He's like, Jer- or Jerry's like a million years old. And it's like, Logan, you're a million years old. Like, you yeah, are right. acting so up in arms about this. I think that scene is so funny, too, because it shows how Logan is like, it's not really involved in, like, the private lives of his kids. Like, he really doesn't spend a lot of time thinking, like, their right. inner lives or even, like, their marriages or relationships. Mm-hmm. And yeah. he really is so focused on who is giving him the most attention, who's earning his love the the strongest, um, and, you know, who's going to be next in charge. Hunter, thank you so much. Hunter Harris, you can find her excellent writing about succession on her Substack. It's called Hung Up. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right, now we go deeper into this emotional roller coaster of an episode with its director, Mark Mylod. Mark has been directing episodes of Succession since season one. He's also an executive producer on the show. His other directing credits include an entire fantasy world of dysfunctional families, of course, Game of Thrones. Um, But we're here to talk about Succession, uh, unless you want to talk about Winter is Coming, but I think we got that one and we sort of figured that one out already. Hi, Mark. Welcome. Hello. Thanks so much for having me. We're going to dig into two particular scenes, which were really riveting uh, around family dynamics. But first, I'm curious, what was it like directing in Italy versus the usual settings around New York? I mean, what would have been different? Obviously, you're in this beautiful setting. It's supposed to be pleasant and it's incredibly unpleasant is what it is. Yeah, the the shooting in Italy in that time, and, and I feel a little guilty saying this, was a, a total joy because of the pandemic. The uh, There were very few tourists around, particularly when we were first over there scouting and in the early stages of shooting. So places that would have been very difficult, if not impossible, to have access to, we we had an open door. Um, And once we were in them, because they tended to be, you know, large properties, large estates, we were pretty Mm -hmm. much self-contained. So, which is, of course, massively different from the experience of, you know, shooting on the street in New York. Well, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of what helped in the the early episodes is this sense of suffocation Mm, around the family. But mm-hmm. it was still suffocating in Italy, actually. They still had that sort of pervasive feeling. And let's go on to the first scene I want to get into, which is Shiv and her mom, which was just devastating with her mom, Caroline. Mm-hmm. Um, in this clip, they're talking about their long history, sniping at one another. Let's listen. I don't think I've ever won a single battle in my whole life. Mm. I was 10, Mom. I was a fucking kid. You were 13. And you knew how to twist the knife. You knew then, and you know now. And I might cry. Oh, yeah, where's the onion? You were quite a piece of work. You were my onion. You are my onion. Yeah, well, you're my fucking onion. Truth is, I probably should never have had children. You've made the right decision. Some people just aren't made to be mothers. I should have had dogs. Ouch. So 
How did you and the actors talk about the scene going into it? Because this is like, oh, my Lord. George and Martha have nothing on these two, actually. <laughs> it's funny. Um, I would love to say that I constructed the scene from nothing, but obviously with that kind of writing and with those two actors, um, 98% of my job is done for me, if, if I'm honest. Um, we We don't tend to do a lot of talking in advance. Um, there, is a, a, there is such a premium on spontaneity or on the immediate that, that we tend to launch into it with as mm. little rehearsal as we can reasonably get away with and then shape and play and, uh, and duck and dive with, with tone and other elements as in, in subsequent takes. So it's a constantly kind of evolving process. We, mm -hmm. we tend to see where it goes and then, and then start to modulate as we go. One of the big conversations actually between Harriet and Sarah and myself and Jesse um, was over the, the, the actual staging, which if you recall the scene, it is mm -hmm. quite formally staged in that one character, Harriet's character, is already outside having a fag um, and, uh, and Snooky comes over and, uh, and joins her and they, they sit down and you have this beautiful backdrop of Cortona. But Jess, Jesse's concern initially was that it felt too too classically staged and what could we do to mess it up and and messing things up is a thing we do at almost every level from script to edit you you might not be paying any attention except for their dialogue I, it reminded me of a quote from joan didion where she says i have another cup of coffee with my mother we get along very well veterans of a guerrilla war we never understood um <laughs> it's kind of perfect that's what i was thinking of during the whole time so how how conjured making it uncomfortable and familiar at the same time and that balance? The, the text is so loaded that you don't need to lean into it. In fact, if you do, it, you know, it can, it, it can tilt it into melodrama. Mm -hmm. Most family assassinations are, are done, you know, with kind of in this kind of silken throwaway fashion. And, and the, the boys, because if there's one thing the family have in common, it's uh, they are actually incredibly intelligent. And they also, of course, on top of that, have that familial instinct of exactly where the weak point is and, uh, and can go for it with such, you know, with laser to precision. So we never really try to lean into the, to the pain. Um, the, the, the pain happens through, through the words coming out of their mouths. The, the intimacy is the most important thing, um, to, to believe that they are family, um, and, and that's something we're hyper aware of. And in season three, of course, we have this huge advantage of, you know, having been a work family for you know, over the past few years. So getting into that, having that connection is, is a little easier, perhaps. Um, uh, it, it also is hugely helpful that, you know, genuinely uh, Harriet and Sarah get on incredibly well and work in a very similar way. They're both, um, they're both sharers with their eyes. They both build the scene um, between them. So, so the process is very constructive. Sometimes our process can be more deconstructive, even more, even more kind of, uh, you know, based on a little bit of conflict or um, uh, depending on what the chemistry or the, or, or the makeup of the scene is. It, 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 in the case of Sarah and Harriet, they, they find it through, through connection. They find their disconnection through connection. The writer Hunter Harris was visiting the set during the shoot and she told us there had been a soccer game going on while you shot this. Did it affect any way you played the scene or you just like, keep going, let's just... Oh man, there was, wasn't there? Um, <laughs> yeah, it was the Euro 20, but um, well, actually the, 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 the main problem was it was an England game and me and Jesse and Tony and several <laughs> other uh, um, so are, are all like massive football fans, soccer fans. Um, so yeah, we all really wanted to watch. <laughs> And, um, and couldn't. Somebody did very kindly rig up um, uh, an iPad feed that was quite... But, of course, as soon as we start shooting, you just have to turn it off because, um, yeah, how professional would that be? To, yeah, you couldn't go, yay! <laughs> oh, sorry. You just called each other. Yeah. You just knifed each other in the face. Right? Yeah, that's right. We in did actually face. go to the quarterfinal in Rome, um, which happened to be played in Rome. So me and me and Jesse and, and, and the team did go down and at least see a game live. But, but that particular evening, we had to pretend it wasn't happening. Focus, focus on the murderous relationship between <laughs> exactly. the mother and daughter. So let's talk about the dinner scene with Kendall and Logan, the sort of uh, an opposite version of that, but the same, this sort of very cold parent and a, and a child desperate for connection. Um, Kendall arising and looking like a shell of himself. How did you and Jeremy Strong get Kendall to that place? Because he looks like shit. So how do you how do you get to that spot where he's just desiccated, really, in a desiccated environment, actually? 
Yeah, quite. Well, that, that, getting in, getting into to episode eight is a season long process. It starts in November. You know, when we November of last year when we started shooting the season. Uh, Jeremy is as well documented as by method in his approach to the point where I sometimes worry about his health. I've got to be honest. Um, I mean, it's extraordinary the lengths he goes to 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 get that deep into the character. The results obviously speak for themselves, so it's difficult to argue against it. But, uh, you know, you're seeing the arc of the character from episode one through to eight, and, and it is absolute Shakespeare and tragedy, in my opinion. Uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the, that he started with such high hopes um, uh, and that anybody watching could see the inevitability of that failure because Adam, um, um, that, that that would always, that, that flaw would always come back and, and undermine his hopes and dreams. Yeah, he seems to have hopes. He hopes this dinner is going to work out. He either hopes he's going to get him or he's going to get him to love him, really, in a weird way. So that dinner was particularly pathetic, including the, the, the poison tasting scene with the child, which was really disturbing. Yeah. The Sermature is about, obviously, the power swing, the, 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 the pendulum of power swinging between the two characters during that dinner. Uh, to, it was lovely to have the opportunity to put um, Logan at this stage in the season when he's won so many of the big battles with the, uh, 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 at the annual general meeting, that, you know, avoiding the vote, et cetera. Um, uh, no, you know, nobody's going to jail, et cetera. They've got off almost scot-free apart from the big fine there. So for the, to, to, to be able to put the character on the back foot was, was great. Well, not, not for long. So let's listen to a clip. There's things you're able to do that I can't. You've won because you're corrupt, and so is the world. Mm. Well, I'm better than you. I hate to say this because I love you, but you're kind of evil. Don't talk about things you don't understand. Not everyone can live this life. I'm a great revolutionary. A bit of fucking spice, a bit of fun. Fun. A bit of truth. Okay, truth, okay. I fucking know things about the world or I wouldn't turn a buck. Look, whatever. Pay up and let me out. I don't want to be you. I'm a good guy. Wow, these people, the way they speak to each other. What's it like to be in the room when they were filming that? Tense, really tense. Both actors come to set locked and loaded and we want to maintain that. By the time they arrive on set, we're all ready to go. We've locked down what the shots are going to be. And from my point of view, I, I want to be able to give them very specific instructions so that the actors can stay in the zone and just fire as quickly mm -hmm. as possible so that we can get, a, a, you know, that spontaneity, all that. Uh, the, the worst thing for me, and particularly in a night scene, where, which can be a real drag on actors' energy, the last thing I want is for them to come to set and then to be sat around and for all, for all that to start to sag like some souffle. Um, so we want to get going as soon as possible. So so preparation is really important with just the craft elements of it to, to have it all there and ready to go so that we can get into it. So so one of the things is the characters are very quiet in this scene. There's no mm. yelling. And, and Logan yells are grand explosions. Uh, and that made it more tense. It's very under underboiled, you know, kind mm. of thing. How did you decide on this approach? Really, it, it really spoke for itself, really, just in the writing. It's the old acting question of, you know, what do the characters want from the scene? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and neither of them wants a screaming match. The character's flaw, essential flaws, just pulls a Robin himself um, with this need to try to have some kind of victory mm -hmm. over his father, to have some kind of moral high ground, which is really the right. only thing he has left. He's lost, he's lost every battle. And, of course, you know... Logan walks into that room initially with that element of a little bit of paranoia uh, over the over the poisoning. Um, yeah, so talk about that scene where he asks his grandson, uh, yeah. uh, Kendall's son, to taste his food. Talk yeah. about getting that right, because poison comes up a couple times this season, the donuts and now this. Hey, kiddo. How you doing? Good. You like mozzarella? Um, not much. Try this. English kings feels very English kings. <laughs> that was very specifically sad, isn't it? Um, yeah. Um, uh, again, if we, it's just getting the tone right of it. Um, if we lean into it too much, again, it becomes kind of quasi comic, and it, and it mm -hmm. undermines mm -hmm. Logan. The, the the trick there 
was to get it so that actually I believed Logan's actions. Um, and even if Logan knows that there's, you know, maybe a 3% chance that actually his son is, you know, uh, Trying to de kill him. demented enough to actually, you know, uh, 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 roofie him or whatever it might be, um, um, that he's in just enjoying the... Uh, just enjoying almost the game, I think, of of calling the sun in uh, and watching. Mm -hmm. So, when you think about that scene, what did you want to make sure uh, that 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 you got it right? That he couldn't. That it had to be quiet. It couldn't be. It had to be quiet, and it had to be. Um, both characters have to speak their truths. Mm -hmm. Kendall, in that moment, utterly believes that he is this righteous knight, and that his father's a good force for evil. Um, with no. He's not able to step outside no. of his of himself and see the context of his, you know, silver spoon upbringing. Right, right. So, did this change? This scene change from the page to the screen? Very little. It was a ten-page scene, I think, on the page. That when you read it, you can just feel the hairs on the back of your neck standing up. And so, and the glorious thing about those, I know those two actors so well now. I know that they had exactly the same reaction as I did, and let's not fuck this up. Did anything surprise you after seeing the performances play out? It, and initially, it didn't hit for the first couple of takes. Um, I couldn't get the vibe quite right in the room, but then Brian just went on to a different level. He just hit it. He just hit his stride. Um, and thank goodness the cameras were alert to it and started moving in closer and closer. And I just sat at the monitor with my toes vibrating um, and just knowing that that was it, knowing we had the take. And, uh, and by the time Brian walked, stood up and walked away, absolutely knew we had the scene at that point. He'd just, um, he'd just found that effortless power just uh, the way and he just eviscerated him. Very violent in a, the quietest way. Extraordinarily so. Um, and it was the most, you know, beautiful juxtaposition. It really was. You know, that's why we watch the show, isn't it? Yeah. Um, everything's yeah. a contradiction. Yeah, a hundred percent. Mark Myla, director and executive producer for Succession. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. This is the official podcast of HBO series Succession. And it's a production of HBO and Pineapple Street Studio. It's hosted by Kara Swisher. Our executive producers are Gabrielle Lewis, Barry Finkel, Max Linsky, and Jenna weiss Bourbon. Our senior producer of the show is Nick White, and Darby Maloney is our editor. This episode was produced by Michael Catano and me, Shaka Mali, and engineered by Michael Catano. Production music is courtesy of HBO. Till then, clock the fuck up. Okay. <laughs>